Good afternoon. Um, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation by Brian Eckdale, Associate Professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the University of Iowa, who will speak to us today on African elections as a testing ground, newspaper coverage of Cambridge Analytica in Nigeria and Kenya. I'm Janet Linus, ICFRC board member and host for today's program. We would like to take a moment to thank our members, our volunteers, and our interns for making these forms possible. And I also want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, the University of Iowa International's programs, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. And I also want to thank today's special sponsors, Dave, Denise, and Mike Tiffany, Jim and Pat Evgrave, and Ruby and James Watson. Uh, I also would like to thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2, and the U of I Liber Library's Digital Archives. I can talk here. Uh, please be sure to like City Channel 4 on Facebook, if you would. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Brian Eckdell. Brian Eckdell is an associate professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Iowa. He studies media work within global digital cultures, or how and why people create media in the digital era. Much of his research focuses on Kenya, but he also has published scholarship on digital journalism, travel influencers, and social media algorithms. Brian has professional experience as a software trainer, instructional technologist, and video producer. His current research project looks at the relationship between the gig economy and the informal economy in Kenya. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ekdale. Thank you, Janet, and thank you all for, for coming today. Um, so she introduced me. Um, so as she said, I'm an associate professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Um, I want to acknowledge that this presentation today is part of a co-authored product, um, project with uh, Melissa Tully, who is also an associate professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. So Melissa couldn't be here today, but I want to make sure I acknowledge this as a, a collaborative work. So both Melissa and I do research on media in and about Kenya, um, and we found um, some of the stuff she's working on right now is about fake news and misinformation, and I'm really interested in digital media in Kenya, and the Cambridge Analytica story was kind of an interesting one that combined some of those together, and so um, so we, we wanted to pull these um, pieces together and, and do this work together. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm not sure how familiar folks are with Cambridge Analytica, so let me give you kind of a rundown of what I want to do today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what Cambridge Analytica was. We can speak about it in the past tense because it no longer exists. Uh, what was some of the work that that organization was um, involved with? Um, what was some of the scandal surrounding Cambridge Analytica? Um, and our interest in particular is in what Cambridge Analytica did in Nigeria and Kenya. And so I want to talk a little bit about what we know about um, what they did and in, in the, what they were alleged to have done in these two African countries. Um, and then I'll get into kind of what our contribution was specifically, which is essentially we looked at newspaper coverage within these two countries about Cambridge Analytica work in these countries. Um, and then I want to close with uh, some thoughts on kind of what we can we can take away from this. Um, I will say that this um, this uh, research project was recently published in a journal called African Journalism Studies. If anyone's interested in reading the whole thing, feel free to shoot me an email and, and I can send you a copy of that. Okay. How many have heard of Cambridge Analytica before? Okay. So most of us. Okay. Well, let me, you know, let me just run down a little bit um, some of the facts about Cambridge Analytica so that um, we're all on the same page. So it's, it was a um, political consulting and data analytics firm. Um, it came from a well-established group called um, Strategic Communication Laboratories, or SCL. Um, they had been working for years doing a lot of communication work for uh, military and defense clients. But they were really interested in getting into politics and political elections um, because they're more lucrative. They were particularly interested in getting into the American political campaigns because they are very lucrative. And so they wanted to find ways to work into um, 
uh, European and American campaigns. And so Cambridge Analytica was a subsidiary created kind of around that effort. Um, in the early years of Cambridge Analytica, they attracted attention from Steve Bannon, um, if maybe familiar, you know, Donald Trump's former campaign manager, um, who then worked in the White House for a period of time, also, you know, used to run Breitbart. Uh, Cam or Steve Bannon was very interested in Cambridge Analytica, and so he introduced them to the Mercer family. Um, the Mercer family is uh, kind of a group of Republican super donors, um, very conservative donors, and they invested $15 million in Cambridge Analytica. Um, so it had a lot of weight behind it from um, prominent conservative uh, players. One of their big things that they use to kind of stand themselves apart is they, they advertise themselves as unique in doing um, micro-targeting. So micro-targeting isn't unique. It's basically sending messages um, to smaller groups of people as opposed to when you put a commercial on the television, you're getting a really mass audience, right? Micro-targeting allows you to look at smaller subgroups of audiences. So they were saying, we do micro-targeting, but we do micro-targeting based on psychographics. Now, psychographics are different than demographics, right? Let's say I'm trying to advertise a product and I want to make sure that it goes to this particular age range and this particular gender and this particular race. Psychographics is more about values, interest, things like that. And those are actually much more um, um, valuable to marketers because it's not just who you are. It's what you're interested in, what you like. So... They were basing some of this off of academic research, and they were looking at this um, model called the Big Five um, Factor Model and saying that each of us, all people can be rated on the spectrum of these five factors, openness, neuroticism, conscientiousness, agreeableness, and extroversion, right? All of us sit somewhere on this spectrum of that. And so you might be able to take an individual and say, this person has a certain amount of openness, um, but they're not very extroverted, right? What Cambridge Analytica was saying is, we are going to be able to micro-target users based on these personality factors. And one step further, we're going to determine where someone sits on this spectrum based on what they're doing online. And that's a combination of what they were doing on the internet, but also what they were doing on Facebook in particular by the number of Facebook likes. And this was based on a, um, an academic who did a study that said, I can tell someone's personality pretty well based on what their Facebook likes are. So they decided, well, let's see if we can kind of push this out to scale. So they hired... Um, uh, a, a man named um, Alexander Kogan, who designed a Facebook quiz. Um, and how many people have taken a Facebook quiz at some point in their life? Okay, only a couple of years. All right. Well, these used to be really popular, maybe five or six years ago. Qu Facebook quizzes were really popular, but most people who took Facebook quizzes didn't pay a lot of attention to what they were agreeing to. This is, uh, this is a Harry Potter quiz, so this isn't the actual quiz. Um, but you can see when you go to take a quiz on Facebook, it says allow access. Allowing which Harry Potter character are you access will let it pull profile information, photo, your friend's info, and other content that requires it to work. So pre-2015, if you took a quiz on Facebook, you were basically giving the creator of that quiz all of your data and your friend's data. And so um, Cambridge Analytica worked with this academic to design this quiz called um, This Is Your Digital Life that was based around that five-factor model we looked at. Um, 270,000 users took that quiz, so they were able to get the personality attributes of about 300,000 people and then connect it with their Facebook likes and the other information that Facebook had about them. But what was more valuable, because each of those users was granting access to their friend networks, Cambridge Analytica got access to 87 million users' data through this. Now, at this point in time, right, this is 2013, this was within Facebook's terms of service. Facebook allowed this to, to occur. And so Cambridge Analytica was following Facebook's rules in doing this. There was some pushback to allowing this much data access. So in 2015, um, sorry, it's asking me to restart. So I'm going to say no, thank you. OK, so in 2015, Facebook realized there were some issues here. And they changed the rules and said, OK, you can no longer access 
friends of friends, right? So if I take a quiz, I can agree to give them all my data, but they don't get access to my 800 friends anymore. And they told all these app developers, if you have data from friend networks, you have to get rid of it, right? You've got a certain period of time to do it. Once that time's up, you got to get rid of all the data. And presumably, well, Facebook thought, well, surely people listen to what we said and they've deleted the data and the problem is over. We can move on from that. Um, it's not quite how it works. Um, so so um, as we get to later, um, part of the allegations that Cambridge Analytica held on to this data long past when they were supposed to and use this in their election work. So what kind of campaign work did they do? If you've heard of Cambridge Analytica, you probably think of it in terms of Donald Trump or Brexit. Those are probably the two most famous clients that Cambridge Analytica had. They were actually in the 2016 Republican primary. They were first hired by the Ted Cruz campaign. The Mercers um, were actually big Ted Cruz supporters before Cruz um, dropped out of the race. And then eventually things consolidated around Donald Trump. So Donald Trump's campaign, um, both his campaign and his PAC um, hired Cambridge Analytica to do work during the um, uh, presidential general election. They also worked for the Vote Leave campaign um, in the 2016 Brexit referendum. Um, both of those, both Trump and Brexit, won in fairly kind of surprising um, uh, elections. And Cambridge Analytica didn't let that moment pass. They went out and did kind of a victory lap of look at this model we've created, look at what we've done, and look at these surprising elections we were able to bring about because of, of uh, what we did. That said, they were still kind of a closed book. There was a little bit known about what they had done, but a lot of it was still pretty secretive. And in fact, um, some people who had you know, worked with Cambridge Analytica who had thought about working with them said that they were a company who um, said they were able to do more than they were, right? They, had, they made big claims, but they weren't actually always able to follow up on that claim. So it's a little unclear how effective Cambridge Analytica was in doing some of the work that they did. Um, but they certainly did make big claims that, that they had done it. So this is around 2016. There were some news articles that came out around this time about the psychographic model, but it was all pretty um, kind of hazy. Up until March 2018, so in March 2018, The Guardian, The New York Times, and then Channel 4, uh, which is a British broadcaster, um, published extensive reporting on what was going on with Cambridge Analytica. What were some of the campaigns that they worked on? What were some of the campaign tactics? And this is when it was first revealed that they held on to that data, that Facebook data. They took the Facebook data and they matched it with voter records. And they used this to micro-target um, you know, uh, uh, vote, potential voters. Um, you know, in, in various elections around the world. Um, I'll point out, part of this was brought about by Christopher Wiley, who was a former Cambridge Analytica employee who became a whistleblower. Um, a lot of the information, at least initially, came from kind of getting him to, to break and tell about the company. This is, um, this picture in the middle is from the Channel 4 um, documentary. They did a five or six part documentary. And then um, Carol Cattlewaller, who's a, a journalist for The Guardian, really has led all the reporting on this. So, um, and she was a, a Pulitzer finalist for a lot of the work she did um, in the revelations about Cambridge Analytica. The Channel 4 documentary, so, so um, The Guardian's reporting had a lot of research based on documents, based on interviews with former employees. And the Channel 4 documentary was really damning because they sent an undercover fake client to meet with Cambridge Analytica to see about having them work on their campaign. And during the course of that, um, they made several claims about things that they have done and did some ethically, made some ethically, legally, legally, ethically dubious suggestions, um, including uh, uh, proposing that they could take the, per the client's um, opposition um, or opponent and, and, and trap them with a, with a prostitute, right? Types of things that you know political consultants aren't usually supposed to get involved with. After that Channel 4 documentary aired, within um, days, uh, Christopher Nix, or sorry, Alexander Nix, who was the um, the man sitting there, who was the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, resigned, and then within two months, Cambridge Analytica went under. Right, so it went completely defunct after that. So the the you know these exposés in March 2018 and I'll reference them as just kind of the the March 2018 exposés a couple times because they 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 
they're a turning point in kind of the the life of Cambridge Analytica. So they revealed kind of this uh, un, um, unlawful use of Facebook data, right? Continuing to use it um, after they were supposed to. There was also kind of a wider awareness that Facebook, at least at one point in time, was allowing app developers to have this data and wasn't doing a very good job of containing it. Um, it re revealed a bunch of unethical campaign tactics in countries around the world. And it also revealed that Cambridge Analytica had worked not only in the U.S. and the U.K., they had worked in um, Nigeria, Kenya, Mexico, Australia, India, Trinidad, Tobago, and several other countries. So they'd been involved in a bunch of different elections, sometimes under the Cambridge Analytica name, sometimes in creating these little shell companies that were doing the work for them as well. So... Most of the news coverage about Cambridge Analytica um, that came out around this time did focus on Trump and Brexit. So most of the news coverage that we consumed in the U.S., but also around the world, that became kind of the key focus. But as someone who studies African media and uh, with Melissa as well, we were really interested in what happened in Nigeria and what was happening in Kenya and what were those countries saying about Cambridge Analytica. So let me get to what we know about what Cambridge Analytica did in these two countries. So I, I mentioned you know, some of the other countries that it was involved in. So let me get to, to Nigeria here. All right, so in 2015, so this is a year um, before uh, Trump won the presidency, the year before uh, the Brexit referendum was, was passed. Um, Cambridge Analytica was hired by a supporter of then president, good luck, Jonathan, wasn't hired by his campaign, but was hired by, um, the reporting, um, in the guardian says a billionaire supporter of the president, um, to support, um, his campaign. It's worth noting that good luck, Jonathan eventually lost the, the campaign to, um, Muhammadu Buhari. So president Buhari has won re-election in 2019. He's still the president of Nigeria. The, um, this is the, the um, article that came out in The Guardian. It was one of the very first articles to come out in these series of posts about Cambridge Analytica, about their ruthless bid to sway the vote in Nigeria. The two kind of most damning allegations that came out in this report, one were, was that um, Cambridge Analytica was trying to find um, basically dirt on Buhari. They were trying to find dirt on Jonathan's opponent. And they worked with an Israeli um, intelligence firm, Black Cube, to acquire hacked medical and financial data about Buhari. Um, and there's kind of a riveting story told in the article where um, someone, an expert from Israel, flew to London with a laptop with this information, came into the Cambridge Analytica office, and the bosses instructed everyone to take a flash drive from that laptop and load it on their computers. And the employees figured out pretty quickly they were dealing with hacked illegal data, and they started freaking out. The word got to the people in Ni the campaign or the, the campaign workers in Nigeria um, working for Cambridge Analytica. They started freaking out and they immediately bought plane tickets out of the country because they were so worried that if the information got out that they had hacked data into this presidential candidate, that their lives were at stake. And it's also was reported in this that there was a, um, a pretty sensational um, and graphic attack ad um, produced about Buhari um, that was imagining a world in Nigeria, if Buhari won the election, what would happen? And Cambridge Analytica was involved in, in pushing this on social media and micro-targeting. I'm gonna show you, um, The Guardian found the video ad. The full ad is not um, available anywhere, but The Guardian um, put a, a, a video up that has clips of it with some information. I'm gonna go ahead and play it just so you get a sense of kind of what Cambridge Analytica was doing. It will, Note that there are some graphic scenes in it, but this was an ad that was spread on social media, um, presumably created by Cambridge Analytica. So that was Christopher Wiley testifying to a subcommittee um, of British Parliament um, after kind of the ex exposés came out and, and talking about what Cambridge Analytica was doing in these various countries. So this is what Cambridge Analytica was up to in Nigeria. You should note that Cambridge Analytica has denied these allegations, um, but there seems to be a lot of evidence to support um, that their involvement was like this. So let's look at what was going on in Kenya. 
So in Kenya, um, Cambridge Analytica actually worked on President Uhuru Kenyatta's, both his 2013, his first election, his 2013 campaign, and 2017, his re-election campaign. Um, not much is known about the 2013 campaign, um, but where this, um, the Kenya story drew attention is in the Channel 4 documentary, when the Cambridge Analytica executives are trying to pitch their services to a potential client, they talked about what they had done in Kenya specifically. And they claim to have run just about every element of the campaign. Again, they were known to kind of overboast. So it's again, it's, we should be a little bit skeptical of, of what they did. Um, but they talked about rebranding um, the party. They talked about doing extensive research, writing the manifesto, writing the speeches for the candidates. Um, in particular, in the Kenya context, um, Cambridge Analytica, uh, Analytica was accused of promoting another video attack ad um, of Kenyatta's opponent. So uh, his opponent was Rilo Odinga. If you know anything about Kenyan politics, he's like the perpetual opposition candidate um, who's not quite um, been elected um, under some you know shady uh, election circumstances. Um, but they they produced uh, or accused to have produced uh, a video ad. So let me play the video ad. Um, the this is the actual ad that was um, spread on social media during the, the 2017 election in Kenya. Now, again, Cambridge Analytica has denied involvement, um, but there's certainly some evidence to point out that, the, that they were involved in this. So what interest us, interested, interested us uh, about looking at Nigeria and Kenya specifically is there's some interesting similarities and differences, right? So, you know, the baseline, these are the two African countries that got attention for um, Cambridge Analytica's work there. There is some evidence that they maybe worked in some other countries as well, but these are the ones that we have the most evidence about. Um, in both cases, they worked for the incumbent candidate. So, you know, they worked for Kenyatta's first campaign, but his re-election campaign in 2017. Um, in both cases, Cambridge Analytica was credited with promoting this really emotionally driven attack ad that plays off big social divisions in each of those countries. So religious divisions in Nigeria, ethnic divisions in Kenya. Um, and both con countries have poor data protection and privacy laws. Um, I should say that, that they have passed laws recently, and I'll come back to that later. But there are some interesting differences as well. In Nigeria, the, the candidate that they worked to um, elect lost, and in Kenya, that candidate won. Um, the Nigerian election occurred before Trump and Brexit, and then the Kenyan 2017 election occurred after. And... Um, after these March 2018 exposés came out, the Nigerian ruling government ordered an investigation um, into what was going on with Cambridge Analytica in their country, and in Kenya they did not. So there are some similarities, but there's also some interesting contrasts as well. One of the things that, that drove us into this then was looking at, as we read kind of um, reporting about Cambridge Analytica in you know, American and in global press, there were kind of these three issues that seemed to come up again and again um, in response to this scandal. One was this issue of data privacy and protection, right? So what is happening with our data? A lot of the concern that comes with um, talking about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook is who did Facebook allow to have access to our data? What did Facebook, you know, Facebook wasn't really being careful with our data. What are other companies doing with our data? And what kind of law should we have in place um, to protect from something like that? Another issue that came up was this idea of unethical campaigning on social media. Um, a lot of the coverage about Cambridge Analytica was looking at voter suppression efforts that they were a part of, trying to get people to be apathetic and not vote or try to turn people away from voting, um, both in the African context but also in the American context. This was part of what their work was. So these unethical campaigning, some of these video advertisements that we see here, some of the advertisements we saw um, against Hillary Clinton that were being spread on social media. And then this third one that was looking specifically at um, where Cambridge Analytica was working in the developing world was this idea that there was foreign, continued foreign involvement in these elections in the developing world, 
right? That that you know, it's these are certainly private companies that are involved. Um, but but this is a, a Nanjala Nayabola is a Kenyan author who was really concerned about like what does this mean for our, the sovereignty of our elections, right? If we have these people coming in and messing around, and particularly not with a lot of respect. Right there, there was some evidence that, um, or some of the claims from K- former Cambridge Analytica employees was that they saw these as places where they could kind of experiment. Right, they could experiment tactics that they could then take into the U.S. and the U.K. where the elections are more lucrative. So they could see what worked and then use it as kind of a testing ground, which is the the title of our paper. All right, so what did we do specifically? We wanted to see kind of do these issues come through into the local coverage in Kenya and Nigeria um, or what issues are, are coming up in those contexts. So our methods, um, we gathered news articles in two Nigerian and two Kenyan publications. Um, the two we picked in Nigeria are Vanguard and Punch. There are several um, newspapers in Nigeria that have a wide circulation, and, and these are you know relatively neutral players in that market. Um, in Kenya, there are primarily two daily newspapers, uh, the, the Daily Nation and the Standard, those were a little bit easier to work with. What we did is we went um, and we searched their archives for each of these papers for any reference to Cambridge Analytica. And we found about 260 articles on these, you know, combined across these, these papers um, that contained some kind of reference to Cambridge Analytica. But we were particularly interested in articles that talked about Cambridge Analytica in these countries, right? So there were a number of articles that were talking about Mark Zuckerberg is testifying before US Congress. Part of the things he's going to be asked about is his work with Cambridge Analytica. We weren't as interested in those articles. We were interested in what they were saying about Cambridge Analytica's work in their own countries. So when we kind of created a subsample, we ended up with about 100 articles, um, 31 from Nigeria, uh, 74 from Kenya. So more articles were published in Kenya than, than were in Nigeria. And then we went through and we read and we analyzed and we um, started kind of writing out themes that we were seeing and we had conversations with each other as we were both going through these. So let me talk about each country specifically and then we'll, we'll bring them together. So let me start in Nigeria. So remember the, the exposés came out in March, 2018. So basically the two weeks following this um, flood of investigative reporting on Cambridge Analytica, which included these claims about what they had done in Nigeria, both uh, Vanguard and Punch um, published several articles, right? So they, they were paying attention to what was going on, what was being said about their country. Um, for the most part, this reporting just kind of summarized what was already being said in these international reports. So they were summarizing the Guardian's reporting or summarizing some of the things found in, in Channel 4. I didn't find anything that they had um, printed that provided additional information about what Cambridge Analytica had done in 2015. Might They provided a little bit of more current local context, but there was no real I- additional investigative reporting that occurred in either of these publications. But in fact, what was happening, well, let me step back a little bit. What was happening here is that pretty quickly, the Cambridge Analytica story just became kind of a wedge issue between two competing political parties. So in Nigeria, by the time this came out in 2018, they were looking to the 2019 presidential election, and there was going to be a rerun of these um, two primary political parties. And they really just kind of situated as a back and forth, as a wedge issue, rather than um, something more serious than that. So let me pull out a couple uh, example articles so that you can see. So the... um, PDP was the um, political party of Good Luck Jonathan, so the man who, who um, was Cambridge Analytica was hired to support and who eventually lost. And then the APC was um, Bahari's um, party. So Cambridge Analytica, PDP's desperation in 2015 compromised national security, says APC. So this is the ruling party spokesman pointing out that the opponent was desperate, and that's why they hired Cambridge Analytica. Um, you probably won't be able to see this very well, so let me read a couple parts of this. Um, so the spokesman in response said that APC had suspected all along that the ruling party was so desperate that it didn't know, but it didn't know that the PDP would descend to the to the level of compromising national security in a bid to achieve its aim. The APC spokesman explained that the revelation had now exposed those who were really behind the ethno-religious divisions introduced in Nigeria's political space during the historic elections. Right, so the ruling party is saying we can't believe that the opposition did this. They were fueling the flames of ethnic division. Well, an article coming out essentially the same day, 
is the response to that, right? So PDP pillories presidency over alleged hacking claims. And so they came back and said, well, in these articles that are coming out about Nigeria, none of them said that Good Luck Jonathan had hired um, Cambridge Analytica. They just said a supporter hired Cambridge Analytica, right? So they then they're claiming that the ruling party was trying to create a scandal that wasn't there, right? And so the party, the party said President Buhari's handlers decided to concoct the fabrications just to divert public attention from the overwhelming national and international rejection of their administration, especially, especially um, Bill Gates' verdict on the economy, right? So they're saying, no, the president just wants to distract you from what is a failing um, economy going on right now. Even after um, the ruling party said that they were going to investigate what went on with Cambridge Analytica in the 2015 national elections. This, it didn't really get any more interesting than this. So the, um, the, the um, Good Luck Jonathan's party responded to this news that there was going to be investigation, said, the party said, while it welcomes an open investigation into the Cambridge Analytica saga, it also demands that such inquests be extended to cover the sources of funds and to prosecute Buhari's campaign in 2015. So saying, sure, you can investigate our campaign, but it's got to be a wide enough inve uh, investigation that everybody's being investigated. And most of the articles that we looked at were really just a back and forth. They'd never really looked in depth into the particular claims, um, and they never really staked out any ground beside that. Even though um, President Buhari's party opened an investigation into Cambridge Analytica, there were no updates during the entire time that we looked at the news coverage, just that they had, there was one article that said that they asked the US and UK to give them some additional data, but no additional information. In all of the newspaper coverage in Nigeria, there really was no real wrestling with what the Cambridge Analytica story meant um, locally. The only person who did it was there was one opinion columnist named Tabia Princewell, who published three opinion pieces that really tried to wrestle with Cambridge Analytica in um, maybe a more nuanced way, right? So she was looking at, um, you know, the in response to, this came out um, March 28th, so within a week of these revelations, right? So saying that these um, Western publics are shocked to find these illicit practices which virtually rob us in developing countries of our choices of free thinking individuals are now also going to work in their own democracy. The chickens have come home to roost. The Cambridge Analytica scandal confirms huge sums were spent by the immediate past government and its proxies, but without successfully prosecuting anyone who is to say that and this sort of electoral manipulation won't happen again. Right. She's basically saying, stop just fighting back and forth. Let's actually look into the story so that we can protect ourselves in the long term. And, and she published a couple articles that tried to stay on this. The, the Cambridge Analytica story was more than just kind of a political football. It was more significant than that. Um, and this, was, this came out in November. So this was several months after Cambridge Analytica. So this mentioned them again. The, you know, the, the context of this was, as we're getting ready for this political campaign, we need to be really vigilant that we're not <clears throat> believing or sharing fake news or any form of misinformation. So that's what was happening in the Nigerian press. So let me turn to what was going on in the Kenyan press um, at the same time. Now, one of the really interesting things we found is that there were actually several articles published about Cambridge Analytica in these newspapers before the exposés. Now, part of this is because after Trump won and after the Brexit referendum was passed, Cambridge Analytica was a bit of a known commodity. So when it was announced that they were hired by Kenyatta's campaign to work on his campaign, that immediately drew kind of a round of press coverage in Kenya. Um, so this was an article the day after it was announced that, that um, Kenyatta had hired Cambridge Analytica, right? The headline, Will Jubilee, Kenyatta's Party, Try Digital Warfare to Ensure Victory in Elections, right? So the column ends with, we live in scary times. Information technology, which was once viewed as the great leveler that would deliver true democracy to the world's people, is now being used to subvert democracy and promote authoritarianism. Be afraid, be very afraid, right? So this is before that much was known about Cambridge Analytica, other than that, that they had worked with um, Trump and with Brexit. This is um, when that real Ryla video, um, that video attack ad against Kenyatta's opponent started to appear on social media. There was a wire story about it. And it said in the story itself that some on Kenyan's vibrant social media were quick to blame Cambridge Analytica, a company credited with using its data mining and psychological profiling techniques to help swing recent votes in the United States and Britain. Right. So the press coverage was looking at, look, 
this video adds, you know, strikes has some you know striking resemblances with what we're seeing in Cambridge Analytica's work elsewhere, right? So they're at least kind of pulling Cambridge Analytica into that conversation. After the um, March 2018 um, exposés in, um, you know, in particular the the Channel Four documentary that spent a little bit of time on Kenya, a day, within 24 hours of that, um, the Nation had published six articles, a combination of news and um, opinion articles, and The Standard had published another two. Similar to the Nigeria case, there were no original um, investigation facts that were added to what was going on in the international media, but they did provide a lot of local source and, and contextualization and a lot of responses to it. It wasn't just party officials competing with each other. There were other local experts talking about what this means in a larger context, and they looked at legal, ethical, social, cultural considerations. So let me look at a couple examples of that, right? So this was in the Daily Nation, um, why Facebook's suspension of Cambridge Analytica is instructive for Kenya. Um, so it reviewed kind of the larger context of this, and this was written by a lecturer at a university in Nairobi, um, and it ends with this phrase, uh, this turn of events is very instructive and an urgent reminder for Kenyans to quickly get its data protection law into place, right? So trying to say, this is what's going on. We need to step up from a, a policy standpoint. Uh, another article that came out in that same time, interestingly enough, tried to say, we need to stop focusing so much on Cambridge Analytica. Maybe they weren't as effective as everybody thinks they are. And the argument they're essentially making is that the ethnic divisions in these countries determine voting habits so much so that we don't think that these ads are going to be very effective anyways, right? So who honestly believes the lie that a significant number of people, including those active on social media, made up their minds between Mr. Kenyatta and um, Mr. Odinga to vote um, for who to vote for after watching that video, right? So at least showing some skepticism that, you know, the Cambridge Analytica is the shiny object right now, but maybe we need to think about deeper issues that determine our electorate. And then uh, and another opinion piece that um, wasn't just asking about data privacy, wasn't just asking about, um, you know, uh, unethical campaign on social media, but asking like, did this company undermine our democracy by what they did in the experimentation that they did here, right? In a country like Kenya where ethnic divisions have led to violence and bloodshed, is Cambridge Analytica not being, resp not being responsible for stoking those tensions, right? So trying to say like, we have these issues, Cambridge Analytica is part of stoking these tensions. You know, they're not focused on data privacy and protection in the same way. They're focusing on kind of outsiders playing with these ethnic divisions for their own benefit. In comparing the coverage between um, these two sets of national publications, um, some things we found, for the most part, you know, both in Kenya and in Nigeria, there was a lot of uh, repeating of what was found in these um, international um, reporting by The Guardian, The New York Times, and Channel 4. There wasn't a lot of additional investigations, right? There was no real facts that were added to what we know. So what we know about Cambridge Analytica in, in Nigeria and what we know about Cambridge Analytica in Kenya was basically provided by these publications in the UK and in the US. Um, so the local publications didn't provide any more details. In Nigeria, they really treated it as kind of, um, they would make references to it as a generic threat to data privacy. Um, but then for the most part, just kind of treated it as a wedge issue between these political parties. And it was the Kenyan newspapers that really grappled with um, the broader implications of that. Now, there may be a couple explanations for that. I think probably the Biggest explanation is by the time these March 2018 exposés came out, Nigeria was closer to the next election than they were the previous one, right? So they were already thinking about the 2019 election and maybe weren't going to spend as much time dwelling on what happened in 2015. They were focused on what was happening next. The 2017 election, election in Kenya was... Um, disputed, right, to, to say it mildly. So, you know, originally the Supreme Court over, uh, overturned the results because there were so many inconsistencies. And then when the election was rerun, Odinga said he wasn't going to um, run again because he thought they hadn't solved the issues. And so the tensions around that election were still pretty fresh by the time March 2018 came out with these um, Revelation. So it, it does make some sense that the Kenyan press spent a little bit more time um, focusing on this because they were still reeling with some of the effects of what happened in twenty eight or 2017. So just a couple kind of concluding thoughts um, before we, we open it up for, for questions. Um, 
since the time we, we did this study and wrote the paper, both Kenya and Nigeria did pass data privacy and protection laws. I should say we have nothing to do with it. It wasn't like our paper changed their minds. They were, you know, this is something that had been considered for years and years and put off and put off and put off. But then in January, um, Nigeria did push for, forward some data protection laws, and then Kenya just recently passed some. Um, and it is important to pay attention to data privacy and protection. But one of our concerns is that when we put all the attention on one of those three issues, we aren't thinking as much about this unethical campaigning in social media. And we aren't thinking about the fact that that companies, whether private companies or sometimes government powers, are seeing African elections as either a proxy battle um, or they're seeing it as a place to kind of experiment with tactics that they want to take somewhere else. And we think, you know, if these countries want to take that issue more seriously, it has to be something that's a regular part of the media conversation. So thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Oops. I was meant to go. I was just going to leave with this one quote. Sorry. No, please. Um, this was Christopher Wiley, who I'd shown a couple times. So in the story that was about uh, Cambridge Analytica's ruthless bid to, to sway the vote in Nigeria, this first story, um, he called what happened, he called it post-colonial blowback. And I thought this was a, a useful quote to end on. The West found a way of firehosing disinformation into weak and vulnerable democracies, and now has it turned back on us. This is really about our chickens coming home to roost. So... Okay, with co the first question is, with companies like Cambridge Analytica and the Mercer money, does my vote really count? Um, maybe I'll pass that to a political scientist. I mean, I think that, you know, there have often been shady players involved in the political game. I don't think that that takes away from our vote. I mean, the people who work for Cambridge Analytica, they still have one vote in their context. I mean, but there's certainly, I think it, it raises the stakes of being kind of a um, skeptical and critical and a literate consumer of content about politics. Um, I think, you know, Melissa in particular, um, her research looks at news media literacy. So being able to read the, the news and make sense of it in, in a way that allows you to be kind of a critical, literate consumer of content. I think that stuff is really important. So, I mean, in a nation of 300 million people, right, maybe you could make an argument about one vote not mattering that much. But I do think that um, the best way for us to respond to things like that is to vote our conscience and not to listen to the disinformation. This next question is kind of a follow-up for what you were just saying. Please comment on the TV ads that had lots of written words but few spoken words in the context of literacy in the affected target countries and voters. Yeah, I mean, I think because these um, these were ads that were primarily circulated on Facebook, so for that particular audience, right, for the audience that's using social media, they're going to be literate, right? Um, now, there may be some language differences, and that may be a reflection. Both both Nigeria and Kenyan are um, former British colonies, right? So English is widely spoken, um, but particularly spoken in the urban areas and particularly spoken by educated elites. And so it, those messages may not have been effective as effective in rural areas. So in Kenya, where someone is speaking a tribal language or speaking Swahili, maybe those messages are not as effective. But um, I think the imagery is probably... Um, more effective than, um, than, than some of the, the text that's there. Has anyone looked into how effectively micro-targeting depressed turnout in Africa? That's a great question. I don't know if there is any strong evidence to show um, how much it has depressed turnout. I think the um, the level of kind of public opinion survey and research is um, is a little bit less, right? There's just a little bit less data. I will say in some of the reporting that came out, the BBC was able to get a hold of a brochure um, that Cambridge Analytica was using um, to kind of attract new clients. And one of the things it said, it said that the SCL group, so Cambridge Analytica's kind of foreign parent company, had done some work in Nigeria in the 2011 election and had specifically tried to depress turnout. Um, the, if, if, has anyone seen The Great Hack on Netflix? 
which is a documentary about this. They spent a little bit of time talking about it in Trinidad and Tobago. I think this is where they were talking about it. They created a movement that was called, um, it was called like Do It or something. And what, they, what the movement was, was Do It, Don't Vote. And they were trying to get young people to think it was great to not vote, right? That was the way that they were going to make their voice heard. I don't know how effective that messaging is, but... You know, I think we certainly saw in the 2016 election, there was a lot of people that looked at what was going on in the presidential race and said, you know, just kind of viewed it very cynically and say, both of these candidates are terrible, right? I'm just going to kind of sit this one out. And so I do think that there is, um, there has been some evidence that cynicism can encourage people to stay home rather than vote. Next one is who and w or what is the successor of Cambridge Analytica, and are the techniques now mainstream? Um, I don't, you know, I don't know who specifically is the successor. There, um, there has been some reporting that some of the former Cambridge Analytica employees have now started their own companies, um, and and I, you know, I'll just admit I have not done um, that much research into to what those groups are and and, and where they're working right now. Um, some of the big voices of people who worked with Cambridge Analytica, Christopher Wiley, Brittany Kaiser is another one that have kind of tried to say, we're reformed now, we're going to be doing different types of things. Whether or not that's sincere, you know, time will probably tell. Um, but it's not entirely clear. I mean, I think the there is a, um, a conventional wisdom belief that these tactics work. And, you know, I would not be surprised if there are other firms saying, well, if it works and my candidate wins, I become more successful, I make more money, right? There's a, a real logic to trying to do whatever works as long as you're not getting caught or you're not doing anything illegal. So, I mean, I, I, I do think the, the 2020 general election in the U.S. is going to be a pretty gross experience. And, and I think I would not be surprised if there are other people kind of following the Cambridge Analytica playbook. Well, with that, we will we'll be concluding our program. But I want to give a big thanks to Professor Brian Eckdale for the wonderful presentation. scary though it may have been. <laughs> so, uh, I also want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we also thank today's special sponsors, Dave, Denise, and Mike Tiffany, Jim and Pat Epgrave, Ruby and James Watson, and also City Channel 4 for making our programs available for viewing audiences. Now, Brian, as a small token of our appreciation, I am very proud to present to you our highly coveted Ooh. Iowa City Foreign Relations Council <laughs> mug. So. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I will use this. <laughs> okay. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.